Hello everyone and welcome to today's micro lecture. Today we're going to be taking the time to focus on hallucinogens and how they affect us pharmacologically. During this lecture there will be a specific focus on the cultural aspects that surround these drugs. Let's go ahead and get started with the cultural aspects of hallucinogen use. Everything that we have discussed so far has been in either the stimulant or the depressant group, and we will see more of an effect on the entire body. With these previous groups, we've seen increases or decreases in heart rate, in blood pressure, and in breathing rates. Hallucinogen drugs are different in that they primarily affect the brain and the way that we sense things. So taking a hallucinogen causes an alteration in the way that the brain senses things. We see colors differently, we hear noises differently, and sights are distorted, or we may be seeing things that are not really there. Thoughts are processed differently. You may experience anxiety or paranoia regarding your surroundings. You are so in your head that you might not be able to be distracted from these feelings and create a bigger fiasco from things than that are only, that only you rather, are experiencing. Finally, depersonalization can occur. This is a state in which one's thoughts and feelings seem unreal, or they might not belong to oneself, or in which one loses all sense of identity, meaning you might not see yourself as a person anymore, but rather as an object or as a distorted version of yourself. Hallucinogens are often associated with cultural and social movements. Native Americans use peyote in a lot of their religious ceremonies, and it is legal for them to be able to do so. You do have to be a registered member of a Native American church and also be a registered member of a tribe. For the most part, the use of peyote takes place on reservation lands, but it can be taken off of the reservation if it is done by someone who is a minister or a church official. Timothy Leary, the man in this photo, on the other hand, had a much different experience with hallucinogens. He has had a variety of different life experiences that all seem to contradict one another. He was in the Army during World War II. He received a PhD in clinical psychology from UC Berkeley in 1950. He stayed on as an assist assistant professor at Berkeley, and then he moved on to Harvard where he began his research work on hallucinogens when he worked with psilocybin rather than LSD. LSD would ultimately be his drug of choice and would be the messaging that he formed his career and fame on. Leary didn't actually do anything with LSD until he linked up with Allen Ginsberg, who was a famous beat poet and often considered one of the strongest voices of his generation. The two started to campaign for the experimentation of LSD and began working with prisoners as, as test subjects. Their experiments, which were voluntary in nature, found that the use of LSD reduced recidivism by some 20%. After losing his position at Harvard over being arrested for LSD use, he began his famous college campus tours. He also brought his message to music festivals and events like that, but he was more famous for his campus tours. He would go around and expound on the virtues of LSD and how it provided enlightenment and how it would help open up this brand new world to people. He also wrote a book called The Psychedelic Experience, which is still for sale and there is a free PDF version online if you ever want to read it. I have actually posted a free version on Canvas if you want to read that. But really, the book is an instruction manual for what you should do while you're on a psychedelic drug. This is a picture of Millbrook Estate in upstate New York. In 1963, Leary and his colleagues, Richard Alpert and Ralph Metzner, launched the first of what was intended to be a string of psychedelic drug research centers at the mansion in what they referred to as the big house. This is where Leary wrote his book, The Psychedelic Experience, in its drafty wood paneled rooms and coined the rallying cry for the psychedelic movement. Tune in, turn on, drop out in one of its showers. 
As ground zero for the psychedelic movement in America, the house hosted some of the most controversial and visionary personalities of the 1960s. The farm was owned by a family named Hitchcock. They were relatives of the, Menel, of the Mellon family. Think of Carnegie Mellon University or Mellon Banks. The youngest daughter was having an affair with Leary, which is how he was able to get up there in the first place. LSD was still legal in the 19, early 1960s, and visitors to the estates could take the drug in any way they wanted, provided that they wrote up a report afterwards. By most accounts, people under the influence spe spent a great deal of time chanting, listening to records, and skinny dipping in a nearby pond. The psychedelic movement was evolving concurrently with the women's rights movement, civil rights movements, the sexual revolution, the anti-war movement, rock and roll, and all of these elements were part of the com comic drama that was allowed to play itself out on the stage of Millbrook in an atmosphere of genteel anarchy that rendered all things permissible. By the summer of 1965, life in the big house was evolving from a quiet scholarly community to a drug resort where rowdy urbanites were using LSD to fuel omnisexual fun. The potent mid-1960s mixture of LSD and birth control pills proved to be too much for many of the local residents living in the neighborhoods surrounding the estate. When rumors began to spread that acid and, pan and panties were being dropped with equal nonchalance at the Hitchcock estate, local parents waged a campaign to drive Leary from his lair. In the fall of 1966, the house was raided by the Dutchess County Sheriff's Office and Assistant District Attorney G. Gordon Liddy, who would go on to infamy and actually a succession of federal prisons for engineering the Watergate break-in. The event marked the first encounter between Liddy and Leary, political and ideological rivals who would subsequently travel to the lecture circuit together years later in a wildly successful point-counterpoint discourse on drugs and politics. Liddy's accounts of the conversation they had in a quiet broom closet under the stairs of the big house on the night of the raid um, in his 1980 biography serves as a vivid, vivid illustration of the clash between conservative and libertarian ideologies in the 1960s. Quote, this raid, said Leary, is a product of ignorance and fear. This raid, Liddy replied, is a product of a search warrant issued by the state of New York. The two men sparred like that for a few minutes, both trying to get through to each other. Neither was very successful, and ultimately, neither was the raid. No illegal drugs were found at the compound, and with LSD still being legal, there was not much that could be done. When I began my discussion of Timothy Leary and his influence on LSD culture, I began by stating that he's a walking contradiction. He served in the military and has all of this high formal education, but he became known as the fugitive king of LSD, and President Nixon even went on to label him as the most dangerous man in America. Nixon often viewed Timothy Leary as the worst thing to happen to the young people of this country especially as the young Americans turned more and more towards counterculture ideals. Nixon was the polar opposite of the counterculture movement and is seen as the embodiment of the establishment. Later this semester, we're going to discuss Nixon's huge role in sparking the war on drugs. But he saw it as his mission to eradicate the drug problem in the U.S. And at the time, there were two drugs in particular that he hated. First was marijuana, with all of those hippies who were smoking weed. He is responsible for the eventual Schedule I drug classification of marijuana that we still see today. Second, Nixon was out to eliminate LSD and to make it illegal as well. This was solely due to his hatred of Timothy Leary and his influence over young Americans who were, in fact, tuning in, turning on, and dropping out. Nixon thought that if we could outlaw drugs and incarcerate their proponents, then we've solved the issue. Turns out this wasn't the case, and Nixon's pursuit of harsh drug legislation 
created decades of turmoil with an overextended CJ system when it comes to drug offenders. Although all psychedelic experiences can be different for everyone, typically, see, typically we see one of three things happen. Sometimes all three occur during a trip. First, hallucinogenic drugs can create a psychedelic effect. This means that you would, this means what you think it would mean. These are the ones that cause hallucinations, sound distortions, seeing things that aren't there, etc. You could also have a psychotogenic effect where your reaction causes psychotic behavior. This is normally indicated by a serious mental disorder characterized by thinking and emotions that are so impaired that they indicate the person experienced them has lost all contact with reality. People who are psychotic have false thoughts or delusions and or see and hear things that are not there, meaning hallucinations. You could be angry, paranoid, delusional, manic, depressive, all types of reactions. Finally, you have a psychotomimic effect where you are unable to recognize and respond appropriately to reality. When we're talking about hallucinogenic drugs, most commonly we're experiencing an alteration of our senses. This is known as synesthesia, which is a subjective sensation or image of a sense other than the one that is being stimulated, such as an auditory sensation caused by a vis visual stimulus. Things change color, they take on another shape, they might grow or shrink in size. A lot of people report seeing outlines on certain objects. Also, very common, users report a loss of control. This frequently involves flashbacks as LSD can stay in your system for a long amount of time. Flashbacks involve recurrences of earlier drug-induced sensory experiences in the absence of the drug. These can take place months to years after the trip has actually occurred. They can come out of nowhere and can be terrifying for the individual who is going through the flashback. Additionally, LSD can result in self-reflection where users try to, quote, make conscious the unconscious. Freud said this in 1950 um, as an advocate for using LSD in clinical psychology cases. It opens up the mind and allows you to experience or accept memories or feelings that you may have repressed for a long period of time. That might be all right if you're trying to get someone to recover from the death of a loved one or something like that, but what happens when the individual does not find the acceptance that you're striving for? Finally, user, users also report a loss of identity and cosmic merging. Leary described this as the, quote, mystical spiritual aspect of the drug experience. This is what Leary was after. You're no longer an individual with cares and responsibilities tied to a government or a job or a family. You're one with the universe the same way that a tree is or a bird is or a cloud is. There's no beginning, there is no end, everything is linked together. This one is often discussed as being the item that people aren't able to comprehend or explain until they have dropped acid. LSD is one of the most common forms of hallucinogenic drugs and can still be found on the market today. The physical structure of LSD results in a powder that is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Very recently, there has been an increase in the sale of colored powder. This one is purple, but there are greens and blues and oranges, usually very vibrant in color. So what exactly are the different colors for? They are often the calling card of the dealer or the supplier who makes them. LSD can come in powder or in liquid form. The powder can be converted into a liquid form very easily. Once it's made into a liquid, then it is commonly known as acid and can be used with a paper blotter. Microdosing LSD is one of the most common forms of use in the US today. Commonly, LSD is known by its street names of acid, blotter acid, microdot, or window panes, among a variety of other terms. This is one of the most common ways to take LSD. This is a blotter paper. 
It will dissolve on your tongue. You just have a small amount of LSD on the paper in liquid form, and then it's going to dissolve on its own. In the 1960s, it was recommended that for first time users, that you don't go any higher than 90 to 110 micrograms. Very experienced users can go up to the six to 700 microgram range. But if you wanted to limit the chances of having a very bad trip or a really bad freak out, most people would say around the 200 to 400 microgram range. Some say that 250 micrograms is where the best trip comes into play. But this was decades ago and LSD has become a whole different animal these days. With today's LSD, you don't wanna go any higher than 20 to 30 micrograms. That's crazy in comparison to the older forms of the drug. Much more potent today, hence the microdosing. Microdosing is also very common with magic mushrooms as we're going to discuss later in this module. In recent years, microdosing has become increasingly common among a variety of substance users. Microdosing refers to a small fraction of what is considered a recreational dose of LSD or other hallucinogen. Microdosing certain psychedelic drugs can reportedly improve mood, improve, induce um, physical and mental stimulation, and encourage creative thinking. Emerging studies support the notion that hallucinogenic drugs taken in small doses or under the supervision and guidance of a medical professional can be used to treat mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, and even PTSD. However, as we're discussing the benefits of microdosing, we have to always acknowledge that when you're consist consistently using any type of drug, especially one as strong as LSD, you run the risk of developing an addiction to that substance. These are sheets of blotter papers. Each square is one hit and can cost as little as $10, depending on the market that you live in. You really are only getting a little bit on each square. Think of it this way, one gram of LSD would be enough to provide a dose to over 10,000 people. One gallon of LSD would be enough to intoxicate over 3.5 million people. Think about what that would do to a city if someone were ever put that in the water supply. You may also know that this was a big question for folks in the mid 1970s when it was revealed that the US military and the CIA actually conducted human experiments with LSD to learn more about the drug's ability for mind control. Project MKUltra was an illegal human experimentation program conducted by the CIA as a way to identify drugs that would be useful to interrogators who are trying to force confessions from people through brainwashing and psychological torture. The program began in 1953 and was halted in 1973, then revealed to the general public in 1975. MKUltra used numerous methods to manipulate its subjects mental states and brain functions, such as the covert administration of high doses of psychoactive drugs, especially LSD, and other chemicals without the subject's consent. Electroshocks, hypnosis, sensory, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual abuse, and other forms of tor torture also were occurred. Critics of the program compared it to the pharmacological and medical experimentations conducted by Nazi doctors at concentration camps. When the Rockefeller Commission files were released during Gerald Ford's administration, the American public was outraged to find out that these tests were occurring without patient consent. This, however, was not the first time that medical experimentation has occurred in the U.S. without consent. Learning that LSD was involved in mind control efforts, the question was raised, what would happen if the government actually put this into our water supply? This is LSD placed on sugar cubes. You put that in your mouth and you let it dissolve. These are small gelatin squares called window panes. They also dissolve on your tongue and are quite helpful in microdosing efforts. Normally, this would be about the time that I would start winding down our micro lecture, but if you would bear with me for a few more minutes, 
I want to be able to finish the full LSD discussion and share with you some of the most fascinating artwork created while under the influence. LSD is often associated with the creative arts and sparking the regions of our brains responsible for our creativity. This is due in part to the massive increase in neur neural activity in some brain regions, which is known as an electrical storm. This is a massive increase in neural activity. Your brain is just in hyperdrive based on the amount of things that it is, it is experiencing. For some, their most creative selves come out during this electrical storm. LSD also activates our sympathetic nervous systems, which results in a rise in body temperature, heart rate, and blood pressure. What does this sound like? Almost like a stimulant type of effect. But this does make sense, right? If your brain is all over the place, then the rest of you would be as well. Think about how your body reacts when you get startled. You get that little burst of adrenaline and you get warm, your heart might start beating faster. This is what's occurring during the entire trip. What is interesting about LSD is that individuals typically do not become physically dependent, but psychological dependency can occur. For many people, they enjoy the trip caused by acid that they want to keep experiencing these effects. Effects of the hallucinogen can begin 30 to 90 minutes after ingestion and can last up to 12 hours or longer if you include the flashbacks that may occur. Immediately within that 30 to 90 minute span, you are the most likely to begin experiencing increases in creativity and insight. But then adverse psychedelic effects are also likely to occur during this time. This is also when those perceptual effects begin to happen too. Okay, I am about to show you a series of nine drawings that were made about a half a century ago by an artist under the influence of LSD during an experiment designated to um, investigate the psychedelic drugs effects. The unnamed artist was given two 50 microgram doses of LSD one 65 minutes after the other, and had access to an activity box full of crayons and pencils. Over time, the, research has become un the researcher has become unknown, but it is most likely a University of California Irvine psychiatrist named Oscar Janger. During this experiment, the artist reported how he felt the acid was affecting him as he drew each sketch. I am going to report his observations at different points. This first picture was drawn roughly 20 minutes into the first dose. The attending doctor's observations report that, quote, the first drawing is done 20 minutes after the first dose. The patient chose, chooses to start drawing with charcoal. The artist comment is, quote, condition normal, no effect from the drug yet. 85 minutes after the first dose and 20 minutes after the second dose, the patient seems rather euphoric. The artist comments that, quote, I can see you clearly, so clearly. This, you, it's all, I'm having a little trouble controlling this pencil. It seems to want to keep going, end quote. So we're beginning to see some effects of the drug in line with the 30 to 90 minute initial timeline to feel the effects. Observations from two hours and 30 minutes after the first dose and 85 minutes after the second dose. The patient appears very focused on the business of drawing. The artist comments, quote, outlines seem normal, but very vivid. Everything is changing color. My hands must follow the bold sweep of the lines. I feel as if my consciousness is situated in the part of my body that is now active my hand my elbow, my tongue, end quote. Observations from two hours and 32 minutes after the first dose. The patient seemed gripped by his pad of paper. The artist comments, quote, I'm trying another drawing. The outlines of the model are normal, but now those of my drawing are not. The outline of my hand is going weird too. It's not a very good drawing, is it? I'll give up and try again. End quote. 
Observations from two hours and 35 minutes after the first dose. The patient follows quickly with another drawing. Upon completing it, he starts laughing, then becomes startled by something on the floor. The art artist comments, quote, I'll do the drawing in one flourish without stopping, one line, no break, end quote. Observations from two hours and 45 minutes after the first dose. The patient tries to climb into the activity box and is generally agitated, responds slowly to the suggestion that he might like to draw some more. He has, large, he has become largely nonverbal. The patient mumbles inaudibly to a tune. The art, artist comment as, quote, I am, everything is, changed, they're calling, your face is interwoven, who is, end quote. As we continue through these pictures, you can clearly see the breakdown in conversation and the breakdown in function. His vision is distorted and so is his mind. Observations from four hours and 25 minutes after the first dose. The patient retreated to the bunk, spending approximately two hours lying, waving his hands in the air. His return to the activity box is sudden and deliberate changing media to pen and watercolor. He makes the last half a dozen strokes of the drawing while running back and forth across the room. The artist comments, quote, this will be the best drawing, like the first one, only better. If I'm not careful, I'll lose control of my movements, but I won't because I know, I know. He then re repeats, I know, several more times. Next, observations from five hours and 45 minutes after the first dose. The patient continues to move about the room, intersecting the space in complex variations. It's an hour and a half before he settles down to draw again, as he appears to be over the effects of the drug. The artist comments, quote, I can feel my knees again. I think it's starting to wear off. This is a pretty good drawing. This pencil is mighty hard to hold. End quote. He's actually holding a crayon here. And then finally, observations from eight hours after the first dose. The patient sits on the bunk bed. He reports that the intoxication has worn off except for the occasional distorting of our faces. We ask for a final drawing, which he performs with little enthusiasm. The artist comments, quote, I have nothing to say about this last drawing. It's bad and uninteresting. I want to go home now, unquote. This was the last observation in the experiment. As you are now seeing it come down from, as you are now seeing the come down from the trip rather, and how his distortions are beginning to end. However, this was a very interesting look into the mind, how the mind works and functions while under the influence of LSD. Thank you for indulging me through a slightly longer micro lecture than normal. I really thought you would want to see those pictures and explore a real-time acid trip being displayed through self-portrait. This was a thorough exploration of LSD, and in the next micro lecture, we're going to begin discussing other hallucinogens like peyote, psilocybin, and PCP. I'll see you next time.